Welcome everybody to the Bonds Museum. Today is July 9th, 2023, and we are here with our speaker today, Janet Alvarado, and helping her is Robert Ragsack, and they'll be talking about Janet's father, Ricardo, his life, his work, and anything else you'd like to relate to us. And um, we thank you guys for coming, and um, we'll let go ahead, and Robert will do the honors. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> Janet and I have a long history, and let me tell you how it all started. Some years ago, probably 10 or 15 years ago, there was a photography exhibit at the History Park in San Jose, and I heard it was about a Filipino photographer. And of course, my interest in Filipino American history, we always try to get the photographers. So when I went to this exhibit, I looked at the artwork, it was actually the photographic art. So I thought this was fantastic, and this should be preserved somewhere. As I was looking through the photographs, and before I continue, let's make sure that we have we're going to talk story. And part of that story is, when I looked at the photographs, my heart jumped, and I saw this picture. And that Filipino on the far left, holding a Gibson guitar, was my dad. And I recognized immediately where this was. This is a party at the Arevalo's Traverse Cafe, 4th and Jackson Street in San Jose. Wow. At the bottom of the, uh, at the uh, cellar of the um, uh, Brenda Renti Filipino Masonic Lodge, a true Masonic Lodge. Well, this was amazing to see this. So I, you know, it almost brought tears to my heart because I have that Gibson guitar. I still have that. Oh, wow. So when I went through more of the exhibits, I couldn't believe what I saw. Besides my dad, and this is a tribute to Ricardo Alvarado, by the way. It's amazing. Do you see this? Some of you Filipinos may remember this is a social box. Yeah. Right? There's a social box. And I have a name. Which is even more amazing because here, I'll help you, Robert. Oh. So there's, uh, starting from the left, there's Eleanor Torres. She married my brother, Ruben. So she's my sister-in-law, and I saw that. And you talk about my emotional high already for being my dad. There's my sister-in-law, who married my brother. And then further on is Frances Hermano. She married my close buddy, Paul Agasca. And then there's uh, Tony Peralta, one of the girls of the uh, important families in San Jose, the Peralta family. And there was a couple in there that we did not, I were, we were not able to identify, but we did find that this girl here is Anita Lixai, from the Lixai family. So you can imagine that when I met Janet, I thought, how can we be any closer? than your dad taking these photos. <laughs> and when I think about it, it's even more emotional. So, it's important because Alvarado not only captured just photographs of people, for some of us who were able to recognize our relations, our relatives, it's even closer. So, it turns out that when I talked to Jen, that she has his entire glass photographs, okay. right? And there were thousands of them. And then, of course, there was a question about what are we going to do? What is she going to do with them? After I, when I looked at them, they were to be archived. They should be archived somewhere. And I don't want to jump ahead and I, take it. I can't <laughs> wait to spread it, but yeah. yeah so don't make me cry already. It's when, we, when I talked to Jen, I said, we have a meet and talk a little bit about what you're going to do. And she told me that she was also questioning what she's going to do with her dad's collection. So immediately I thought, well, they belong in all of a university library. And in the Bay Area, there are only two. Bancroft Library, University of California. 
Green Library, Stanford. I just happened to be an alumni of Stanford. <laughs> so over a series of breakfasts, lunches, meeting at Royce gas station with Apolakai, Albert Asena. And the three of us spent many hours talking about how to preserve Ricardo's treasures. And you can talk about your dad and how he did all this. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for the lovely um, connection and introduction. And thank you all for warmly welcoming me here to Stockton. Um, the last time I was here, just to kind of dovetail into how we're truly, truly connected through Seattle, through San Jose, through Hawaii, through every other place we all know in this wonderful um, place here we are today in Stockton in particular. And as I look at the artifacts here up on the walls, you know, I was much, I came much, much later um, from when my father was taking these photographs and actively living his sort of pseudo life as an artist. Because I think part of the reason I'm here is to tell you a little bit more about my father. And I told the Fonz members, well, you have to realize I, I just, I, I, this was 20 years before I was even born. So um, one of the last times I was here was with Robert and Mel Legasca. And I think Robert referred to a mutual connection of Fonz. And this is Professor Dr. Albert A. Asena. And he mentored and enchanted me through this entire journey of 27 years. Uh, fast forward, the collection is in a, in a special place now. And um, I think we'll start as the questions are lined up. They're sitting on Robert's prop here. I'm just going to scoot that over so maybe I could get a little guidance on the first question, if you want to ask me. So we're both kind of very emotional right now. It's a big day for the two of us because here we are after like, this is 2017 and Albert just passed away um, in October. I think that was another one time we were together at his service here and in Seattle. And while he's looking at the list of questions or I guess I have to ask myself, Robert, are you okay? <laughs> I, I think he's like, yes, please. Stop crying. You're gonna make me cry worse. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Talk story. Come on, let's. <laughs> anyway, so. Who is your father? Tell us a little bit about Okay, him. thank you, Robert. Okay, thank you for the prompts. So my father, now known as Ricardo Ocreto Alvarado, uh, he was uh, one of the earliest waves that came along with, I guess, many of your parents. Um, the, well, my, my ancestors have been coming since the 1910s, U.S. World War, Navy won. My father was the last to get here to the, to the mainland or the U.S. And so it's documented that he arrived in 1928, but I have another surprise and a turn of events. Uh, so he came, as most did, for opportunity. And he's from a place in the Philippines called Ordineta, Pangasinan, which is the Ilocos region. And I'm going to pause and also mention somebody very special. That's my mom. And they met and married in 1959. But she's from another part of the Philippines, a region called Leyte. And I think some of us know that that's where the liberation of General Douglas MacArthur went during the Second World War. So that's a pretty, pretty significant battle. And I'm looking at the corner of my eye at, the par at the, uh, all of the artifacts here with the infantry regiment. My father wore that uniform as part of the first Filipino um, infantryman. And he was a tech five, a medical tech. Um, and I also see Japanese bomb, uh, Pearl Harbor at the other corner and other artifacts of other of my father's cohorts, veterans of that proud unit. Um, so, so he had, his life mirrors a lot of what most of this population of early young men's lives looked like. He was not cut out for the farm, so he did kitchen work in the hospitals through Bakersfield. Another um, person I just met inadvertently here, I think your former president, Mr. Uh, Rich Tanazas, reached out to me because he did a deep dive and found my father's uh, army card in Sunnyvale. So, um, and just like you, uh, my connection to my father and knowing his legacy and his artwork came from storytelling from his older brother Cirillo 
and he was a farm worker till his last breath. And um, I remember going to San Jose to visit him, and I believe a lot of the photographs in this collection, again, I think we're all truly blessed to have such an amazing collection preserved because I did not know any of the activity until I stumbled on it when I, he had already passed away in 1976. I stepped on it in the basement of the home that I live in and grew up in, um, large negative format, and they just sat still. So it must have moved with my parents to five different locations, and just like that story reads, I'm a product of people that were discriminated against in the early times. The war did open up opportunities for my father to have a better career as a civilian cook with the United States Army at the Letterman Hospital Presidio. So that's my legacy, and I know nothing of what it feels like to work out standing in kitchens, doing dishwasher work, or picking fruit, or any of it, and not because I was privileged, but because when my parents married, I think they had a goal like many of us, our parents had for us, is to be educated and have a better opportunity. And so with that, I can tell you three things about my dad to kind of keep it short and move on to the next topic and do a little more um, description about um, myself and the collection and all of you here today, today with us. Um, three things that were important that I remember about my dad. Um, after he passed. I always remember him. He wept twice. I've only seen him cry twice. And one of those times was in the final house that they purchased in the nice, nicer neighborhood. They started out like everybody else, renting in people's homes until they could afford to pool their money with my um, aunt and buy a home in the Excelsior. And then we moved again to a brand new house before I was four. And to be truthful, my childhood was very sheltered. So I, of course, I didn't know of anything until I got into kindergarten. And I guess that's when I had somewhat of an understanding that there weren't really a lot of Filipinos. I can tell you that there weren't. I was born in 1961. And like other speakers that have shared on this program, I got called names too, and it didn't feel very good. Um, but I could tell you one thing about my mom. She was from a place where those women are very tough. They're called what I, what I women. And my father was very American-esque in that he was just really just a dad. And he let my mom handle everything else. So the culture in my home and amongst all of my playmates, just like you, were, it was full of culture, food, love, laughter. And again, I don't think that that was uh, a deterrent. I think it, it made me become a very strong, resilient individual. And people like Robert, who told stories um, about his child, and even though we're a few years apart, right? It's still the same story. Um, and what's unique about, I think, my father, fast forward to me doing this project, it took me almost, let's see, I found it when I was like, maybe almost 17, but it took me till the 90s. I think I met Peter Jamero when the original Fonz people were still in San Francisco actively doing things. And I, again, um, and I said this in other talks where uh, I went to small schools and I never saw a reflection of us. If I did go to other exhibits or museums, it was usually Japanese American, Chinese American, and I think one of the shocking things that I discovered in the collection was that there were a lot of different ethnicities throughout the body of work. It wasn't just us isolated. And the strength of this collection, um, I think, is in that he was able to capture that. I've, Peter Boccio was one of my mentors as well. I don't know if you all know him. He hails from Seattle, very prolific writer. And he has a very small anthology entitled Dark Blue Suit and Other Short Stories. And it talks about the similar way that Seattle is set up with immigrant families, neighborhoods like Chinatowns, Manila towns, and things like that. So of course I didn't witness any of that. It was until 1961. I barely knew it. I hotel briefly, and then the strikes happened because he was always out of work and sleeping in the basement at our house where we lived at. And that's my, that's where it kind of changes. And where does my genealogy start or end? 
I have to go backwards just like everybody else said. I didn't just roll out of bed and suddenly I found this fairy tale collection of work. I had to go looking for every clue. Um, I didn't know. I, I picked 50 photographs, and if you don't know already, it's, it's on a Redux tour. That exhibit, with the help of people like Fawns in San Francisco, where they were always meeting in Daly City, um, they really, really helped me carry this torch. I'm very grateful and indebted to you know the Cordovas, to Dr. Asana, to people like Robert that are my generation. I just happen to be slightly younger. Um, and I'm still learning. I'm still learning. And I think the biggest thing about my dad, too, is that he, th my parents were very humble people. But they were very, very kind. They were generous. They gave us just a really wonderful education and a good life. So my connection to my uncle Cirillo, um, he was, like I said, the migrant farm laborer, of course. He drank, he gambled, he did it all. He was a real monong. He was a real monong. And um, so he told me of my ancestry. First they came, it was their uncles, the Ocredo branch, they came in the tens. And then came, in 1926, he and their first cousin Marcelo came on the Ocredo side. And my uncle never married. And my father came last. Um, and in that time frame, of course, I don't know anything about that life. I heard lots and lots of stories of, of how um, Uncle Cirillo would kind of make this funny gesture that my father was too, not soft, but he was just not cut out to be on the farm like he was. He couldn't get up early in the morning. He didn't like to be out in the hot sun. He couldn't pick up the motorcycle if it fell. So I guess my father ended up um, working as an orderly in the hospital doing kitchen work. The second memory I, I touched on that a little bit was um, when we moved into that house that I live in now. He was cleaning the kitchen. He was military, so he was very, very, very like clean. He would get up every Sunday and clean the basement, hose it down, put Clorox. He was just very, very clean. Every every dish in the house was never nothing was left in the sink. That was rule. Don't ever leave a plate in the sink. Put everything away after dinner. Um, well, one day I was trying to be helpful, and he started to weep while doing the dishes. I think I was nine or ten, and I'd never seen my father cry, and I just looked at him, and he just said to me, promise me that you'll go to college, even just for two years, learn how to type. Okay, we're talking about the late 60s, so, um, so you can have an office job, a nice job, where you can sit down on your feet and not stand all day. And I was like, okay, I don't know, I'm like, okay, yes. And I always knew I had to go to college. They really, they, it was like, you're going to go to college. You're going to go to college. And I felt a lot of pressure because my brother was very bright and very bookish, and I was kind of the dreamer and, you know, the ringleader. Um, but again, um, yeah, so that's what I know my dad. Now, the third point is about the photography. How did that all happen? Like I said, I didn't once upon a time sit on my dad's lap. I wish he did tell me, look, look at all these negatives, baby girl, and let me tell you what this was. But that, that's not how the story goes. The story goes is that he died. He never really shared that activity with me. I knew he fished because my mom allowed him to. Um, so backwards going to the negatives, like Robert said, I think there's a second question that can kind of dovetail into that. I have another question. Oh. When, when did you begin to realize the importance of your dad's photo? When I stepped on them and found them. I swear it. I mean, I picked it up and I was like screaming because my brother was upstairs. And there were these beautiful Kodak film cheat boxes and I, I, I picked up a funeral and I threw it because I was afraid. I was like, and then I saw black people. I'm like, wait a minute, this, these are not white people. And I knew I, there was just something so special about it. And I called my brother to come downstairs. And again, I don't even really think I told my mom. I just kind of left them where I found them, by the furnace. Um, but it wasn't until much, much later that I began to organize everything and, and realize that. And again, you asked me that question, but it's more like, he, I just told you, I always knew in my heart when I picked it up and found it, it was special. But 
again, I'm 17, I'm going to museums and I'm not seeing anything about us, so why would I even dream in my maddest, wildest, craziest dream would I think they would put my father's picture up in a museum? So it was very difficult for me to get it off the ground and I just would talk about it, touch it, pick it up like, like, like a project, if you will. And um, so many, many years later, like I mentioned, I met the Fonz group and when I saw them on TV, I could tell you, I'm gonna be truthful, I was probably in college, it was in the 80s, I had the TV on, it was on Channel 9, I saw Alex Fabros and everybody else talking on that, do you remember that piece you all did? And I probably was hung over, and I was going, oh my God, I don't believe what I'm seeing, and I got goosebumps. And I kind of started to talk about this um, when I had a job with a Japanese American church Methodist Church in San Francisco and um, I watched how their community did things in San Francisco and it so happened again like I met everybody from the Fonz uh, group early on Adele or Restando and Sonny Paredes and all of those magnificent people they'd have me up and again I was a little bit shy to talk about it um, but I went to a round robin meeting and I started stumbling and I don't know what it is I think I should s tell you this out here because I say it a lot and I've been around for 26 or 7 years I feel like Forrest Gump I'll just happen to meet people tell them about this thing and the next thing you know something happens and it's just crazy even meeting Don Mabalon um, you know we all met when we were very very young um, so I, I always knew it was important but how to get something like this up and into an institution it, it wasn't very difficult but it was I believe in my heart that it was timing Ricardo was ready for it the world was ready for it I was ready to talk about it like therapy kind of but better right because I get to live out some artistic um, you know expression of my father's legacy and I had Peter pushed me Peter Bacho did he goes okay if you're gonna do this it's 1998 you have to make it happen this is your chance it's a centennial celebration and it's going to be a huge commemoration citywide nationwide and that's a push I needed um, and I just put together a team of people and it just kept growing from one idea to the next and one important key person to connect me to the right um, right access to the San Francisco Public Library onto people in the Art Commission onto groups like Fawns and then we got funded and that's how these 50 photographs evolved the narrative all of it I had a team of people um, help me with that and I ended up being the curator because people quit it's not easy to do the first of anything or to try something new and I Dorothy says well Janet why don't you just curate it I'm like oh my god and so I just followed her advice I went back and forth to Seattle a lot because they were my fiscal sponsor Fonz National was the fiscal sponsor for the first grant um, that the Humanities Councils awarded us to develop this narrative and it um, right now this show that tro uh, toured with the Smithsonian is back on another tour and it happens to be here with you all in Mickey Grove at the at the Lodi San Joaquin Valley Historical Society Museum and please come and see it it's, it's up till the end of the of the month do you have another question for me? No, I'm not following the script. <laughs> but what? Uh, maybe you had, should talk a little bit about how you, it, the archives ended up at Stanford. Okay, so 1998, this first show, uh, it, it was it was uh, selected to travel around with the Smithsonian. That tour launched in 2004. It returned, and like I said, there's close to a little over 3,000 uh, of these negatives of different subjects and that's about a 15 20 year period all the boxes have been um, kept so I, I could tell and you know there there was just opportunity to do one other thing and as I watched my mother age I thought I need to do something for her and so I dug in there some more and I the last show in this image through my father's eyes um, is of my mother because once he married her in 1959 he abandoned this work of, in photography and I always said if I ever did another show the first image is going to be her and so what I did was looked for the five 
districts that I knew they lived in that we were relegated to sort of live in in, in that era. Um, and then after that, we also spearheaded the Leyte Landing commemoration bill. And we weren't the first, um, and I'm sure it's been mentioned in other parts of the Bay Area by other groups, but it, it was our parents. I, Mel is back here, he knows this legacy because they had the Leyte Association of Northern California. So that specific year when we met, that show was just being loaned out yet again. And the tour ended in 2006. I met Robert in 2013. People were still asking to see that show and those 800 pounds of crate and artwork and, and panels, it's huge. I mean, and it's still deemed a modest show. So compositions happened and I met Robert and that's where the whole going back and forth and meeting and coming out here was what were we gonna do next? I said, well, I guess I should do this next show. And I did. And so things were going well. And I think it was right before my mother passed away in September in the fall of 2015. Uh, it was only two, there were only two specific institutions vying and asking for the collection. And it was Stanford, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, uh, the UC Bancroft Library. And the backstory about that is when I was doing the composition sh show, I took the hand fiber prints to a lab in Berkeley. And I happened to run into a woman. She was exchanging her cartridges at the lab. And this is one of the only labs in the Bay Area that still does custom hand prints like the ones Robert has from the collection off of negatives. They do traditional work. This is not computer, scan, printed, press a button. These are hand worked photos. And so they are, they are archival in, in quality and they're also very beautifully done because they're done by hand, like a painting would be. So um, I happened to meet the UC Bancroft Berkeley uh, at the time librarian, his name was Jack Bonu. Very, very, very um, large collection. UC Bancroft has the largest collection of Americana of, of, of phot photography and Mark Twain papers and so on. They have a very, very deep collection of photographs of everything, the largest in the country. Uh, the Smithsonian uh, photography curators also came by to the house. And then Stanford was last. I think Robert, um, by way of mentioning or emailing the curators at the Special Collections Library at Stanford, got in touch with me. And then I guess we could say the rest is history. After my mother died, I was, in conversation with all three institutions for about five years. Um, and Albert and I would argue all the time because he wanted it and believed it belonged at UC Bancroft, but Robert always argued it should be at Stanford. And I was just kind of in the middle going, well, okay, I'm just gonna see what happens. And having gone between those two institutions, including the one in Washington, D.C., I already knew I wanted to keep the collection close to the, to the West Coast, where the photography archive and the locations are, are, are from. I mean, it didn't make any sense to go for prestige, because it's Smithsonian, because my dad already had the tour. I mean, that's not prestigious. And they were telling me, well, it takes two years. You can't just access it. Okay, well, that's not, that's not I think, a good fit. But between the two, I guess I finally did. I, I got an ill, I got diagnosed with cancer two years ago, stage four. So here I am, I'm very, very blessed to be with you all today. And I think people should know that because you've seen me roaming around with all of you for many, many years. And I'm still around, um, but we'll see, only God knows. Um, so it's not as if I'm saying goodbye. I got a little wind left, I get a little time left. I bounced back miraculously because it had metastasized. It's not like I just was staged early. And I feel like I should mention that because this is going to be the best vehicle for people to know that I'm still here. And I'm proud to say that, and grateful to all of you, that the, the, the decision was difficult. I think, oh my God, I might die. I better hurry up and make up my mind. I'm serious. I was like, oh my God, <laughs> I'm, gonna have, I'm gonna die from this thing and I have to figure out where this is gonna go. I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not happy about dying, but I'm just saying it, it just, it dawned on me. It was very, very, a very, very um, serious time to decide to make up my mind. And I, you know, I was very clear, very cognizant because all I could do was think either I come 
to a conclusion or I'm going to die and nobody's going to know what to do with this stuff. And so every time I would visit with the Stanford curators, they go, oh, by the way, let us give you this catalog of the Bob Fitch show and we're going to have an exhibit for him. Oh, by the way, this is the, you know, Arrowit show. This is the Italian lettering show, and here's their book. And I, I said, wait a minute, Janet. Every time they said they were going to do something, it got done. And that, I think, was the clue. So I don't think, and, and I didn't realize after it was all said and done and, and all the papers were signed that they would be the, the repository for Ricardo's archives. Not only did they take the negatives, they took everything I wrote. They took my parents' papers, their documents, all the accolades. And I feel very blessed because in that, they'll probably see letters that Albert and I wrote to one another, the letters from the Smithsonian going back and forth, all the letters between Fonz, National, all of those things they wanted to take. So now you know that this is a collection of us. It truly is. It's not the Janet Alvarado and dad collection. It is a very, very, very viable resource for new artists, for scholars, for writers to, to use as documents. You know, you're not just looking at a photo. Look what happened to Robert. I would have never met Robert. That show is 26 years old. And we found each other because of two photographs. And this is not quirky because, I mean, and in this, this show itself, I mean, I'm not lying to you, you know this already, so it's a magnificent gift to everybody. Um, I'm just happy that I didn't discard it, that I discovered it, and that you all, we get to not just talk stories, but this is part of a library collection at Stanford University. So I started looking at this more deeply is like, okay, I didn't just decide because it's a private university, but they have the resources to digitize it and they've digitized it. If you want to go get it, you can go right up there. There are some of you that were in the audience for the opening recently on May 25th of this year. Um, they did a magnificent job of really highlighting um, his, the vignettes of his work that talk about many different, there were places like Spreckles Farm, there were just so many interesting things. Infants that were baptized that can tell you that was St. Monica's, that's my godfather. And that's, that's the dream. The dream isn't to keep saying that, and here's the bigger dream. The scholars there, they're recently, I just, I know I'm jumping ahead of question number three, but um, you got me excited to, to share that news. Um, it's not just that, it's, it, the first scholar that's going to be publishing something in her dissertation is not a Filipino-American. It's an African-American woman. And that's the power of Ricardo's photographs. In, in those photographs are places, people, things, locations, um, comrades, communities, that if those stories and narratives aren't captured, and just like you all in this effort to do fawns, and tell stories. I'm just very, I'm blown away that, you know, this woman, she's a black scholar. She's gonna write about the Bayview. She's publishing a book and dedicated a chapter to not necessarily the art, but, you know, the documentation of her community. And, and that is who we are. That's part of the Filipino American diaspora. We didn't just, we weren't like isolated on an island somewhere. We were all living together in community, taking care of one another's children. Um, another exciting thing happened where a Yale scholar discovered it by visiting and doing her research and she went into the collection inadvertently because they pointed her that direction. And it's being featured, one of my father's images entitled Couples Dancing, Interracial Couples in a House Party. And that talks to this community about, okay, there were laws that restricted us from living in certain places, going into mainstream venues to celebrate, to, to mingle. And so we revert to the house party. And I forgot the, in the title of her, her, um, her article, but it's in the magazine. I kind of knew about it, but if I said the word, okay, I said, well, it's going to be, it, it's published now in the June edition of Aperture, and I didn't realize it because some of my mentors are photography um, renowned, active 
people in, in the art scene and they're blown away. They said, Aperture? And I'm like, well, okay, Aperture. I was at an event at the Academy of Sciences and the same thing. I was in the restroom and some nice lady won a ticket to the Philippines. It was an event by the consulate. And I mentioned that and she happened to work for National Geographic and she said, Aperture? And so I guess that's a big deal that my father cited in Aperture Magazine's June edition in New York City. And that's the part of, of the dream too. I mean, we're looking for who we are, but where's our artists? I know we have Mr. Itliang um, for labor, and I know we have um, Mr. Boulousan for literature. And this is a testimony. He said it. I don't know Robert. Robert so told you all how beautiful these photographs are. And I think one of the most intriguing things about the collection is that, yes, I know everybody has souvenirs, and they even are collecting those things that I have. But again, um, let's just put my father into context of when he came, what he had access to, why would he go to photography school with Ansel Adams at the San Francisco Art Institute or any of that. So I think the third thing about where the collection is, Stanford is just a vehicle. It's just like an ice box, if you will. But like Robert knew, I didn't know because I was going, okay, Robert, why do you keep telling me about Stanford? And I was just getting very like confused and torn between two Apulakais that I love so dearly. And, um, and Albert's a, he's a formal scholar. He's like an historian, United States history guy. And I mean, but I, 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 I just knew in my heart that it was the right, right choice. And I guess I picked the right, you know how you go door one, two, and three, I picked the right door. Um, it's going to open doors, not just for my father, but for everybody else interested in these topics. Um, it's, it's a roadmap to who I think I am as a San Franciscan. I'm so proud of that fact that I get, I know everybody's like, what happened to the chapter in San Francisco? We don't need a chapter. We have a whole collection. I mean, we do need a chapter, whoever's out there that wants to take a leadership role for Font San Francisco, because I think most of them are gone, right? Yes, Peter knows. Um, so fast forward. I do want to mention three things because I, I, I know we're just talking story. This is less formal than some of the other YouTube um, presentations I've seen for Fonz, but I'm just really happy to be here. Um, another thing I want to mention is, again, try to catch the exhibit here before it leaves. I'm coming back up, I think, the week of the 24th. Maybe I'll come on the 26th or 7th. Maybe Terry can just put people in touch or Mickey Grove. Um, and that's for here. And you can just call Fonz or call uh, the museum to see how long that exhibit's here. The other exhibit that's hanging is the one that uh, is hanging at the Rotunda at the Green Room at Robert's alma mater at Stanford University. It's a beautiful show that they put together. Um, and the catalog is forthcoming. I'll be sure to invite myself back up or have you know you all come to their book launch. Uh, I'm going to host that in San Francisco with the Stanford University folks. Um, and thirdly, I, I was just notified that I can announce uh, if you all are in town in San Francisco for August for the Pistahan Parade. It's the 30th annual parade. Um, I think the last two, uh, due to COVID, we couldn't go. And back to Peter, closing my eyes, and people like Terry Davis and Oscar Pena Ronda, when that festival, and, and Nikki's dad, Eduardo, there's a bookstore. I mean, it's just, it's just such a lovely community. I think in the middle of this, when I get a little break, maybe we backtrack and we can piece this part in about intergenerational when we look at some photographs, just like Robert shared. Um, in particular, that weekend, I just learned I was going to get to be, get this, the Grand Marshal of the 30th Annual Pistahan Parade. And when I got the news, I was shocked because, you know, usually they pick some, it had evolved into something different where only like high level people. And I think the group that had the intention to have me step up is, it's because of this. The Stanford exhibit is up in all its glory. It's their 30th anniversary of the parade. Al Perez is the art commissioner, but we all grew up together doing this stuff. And Mel knows this because, you know, Mel, cousin Mel back there, the new president for Fonz. <laughs> and the other Mel as well. Um, that's a long period of time. So I started going to that thing in like 1997. 
and it's already 2023. Um, and I think back to what I told you, you know, my, my, one of my dad's jobs, he's lived in like so many different neighborhoods in the city until he settled down with my mom. They got a home to build and a life to build and they lived their American dream. And I just feel so blessed that I could carry that torch and just throw it out into the world and light it on fire. Cause um, you know, the fact that there's a scholar that did the work and the research about that vignette, about our community in a certain time and space and wrote about it in an artful, intelligent, scholarly publication is a lot for a person like my dad. I mean, we have artists now that are known and being celebrated like Carlos Villa, Leo Valador, people like that, that are showing at major galleries. And you know, my dad is older than them and maybe he'll come behind them. And I think that's another really important thing that I know we surely hold the footing to be recognized, or this, this collection does at least, with the lives that are reflected, because Robert's families are in, in or members are in these, and his contemporaries are in some of these photographs. And can you just imagine that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of more stories that are yet to be told out of that collection once it's discovered? And I think the big concern for me is that if, but I don't, that's, that's not an if, um, hopefully it'll be timely. And I think the concern is that if we don't, and I, I hear many of us say this, just like I'm sitting here right now in Stockton, if we don't capture those stories, they'll get lost. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, when you really think about what she did, it was really hard, extremely tough over all the years. And to have her father honored that way, especially when I hear that the scholars know start looking at his work. So it's bearing a lot of fruit from all your hard labor. Well, it's all of us. I mean, I, I'm looking at, I guess, is it Gigi, Virginia? And, and I just, I'm intrigued every time I see people. And now, I mean, I hate to say this, I'm not being disrespectful. Now I'm an elder. It's like, oh my God, I'm an elder now. <laughs> I'm not gonna say any bad words. I said I wouldn't, I promised Terry. But um, yeah, I'm an elder now, I guess. <laughs> You're still out in general. <laughs> um, what else did you want me to ask? You, or, you covered it. I um, covered it all. But I did want to show a, a picture of, you, of us having breakfast. Oh, where's it at? It's up here. Oh. Oh my god, I look the same. Just kidding, that one. <laughs> 2016. Yeah, that's one of a series of, uh, of so, breakfast lunches that we had, uh, doing a whole lot of talking story. Albert. And I thought you'd appreciate that. You miss Albert, Mel? Was Max still teaching when when you had your exhibit? He was actually the Dean of Social Sciences at CSM, and he was still actively teaching, I think, one or two classes. Um, is that thing on? Yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> like he's like <laughs> so, Okay, we're gonna talk story. So, um, yeah, and if you don't know, Albert came up here a lot to help with the effort of the museum, and he gotten ill one or two times, and, Mel was his guardian angel. He had to stay here a few days, didn't he? Yeah. Albert was a prince. I mean, he really was. Can I ask a question? Oh, absolutely. is it that time? Okay, cool. To use the microphone for us. Thank you. Speak right up into it, please. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank the, the photos were in a big box of some sort, and um, you stumbled upon them. They were, what, downstairs somewhere? Right. And um, that was after your father's death. That I found the work, yes. And how old were you at that time? Well, uh, that was 1976, so 
when he passed, I found it the summer following when I started working. Like I, my mother told me, I had to learn how to respo be responsible. So I was actually looking for his smaller camera, and and that's how I found it. So they it. So truthfully, I still have the crate. It's a wooden crate. You know, my uncle was a farmer. He was a farm laborer. So my dad must have just been throwing all that stuff in these crates. Um, I, I find it so fascinating. It could have easily have been lost forever if you hadn't stumbled across it. But um, obviously, you knew of the collection, and you were looking for it. No, I was looking for the camera. So he had a four by five camera. And I remember, I, I never witnessed my father pull the camera out. The four by five is a big clunky camera that pressmen usually use. Um, and what I was looking for was the one I saw. People refer to it as a brownie. So what it is is a German, you remember the two and a quarter box camera where you kind of like, okay, hold still. And they would like take a picture with, and they hold it like this. Do you remember that camera? So the negatives are like this big. So uh, my mother, God forbid, she threw away all those negatives. She threw away their love letters. Cause she goes, I didn't know they would be important. Cause she was a neat freak. My mom was like a neat freak. She witnessed, yes. Uh, so she witnessed it, but you know, like I said, if, I think, I don't know if any of you have met my mom. She was, she was, well, Mel would know, Mel, cousin Mel, how the sign women are. Very neat, very, you know, very taking care of business. And she probably didn't bother him about it because he was dad and he just wanted to fish and do the photography. But again, I think like I was just saying to you, we moved four or five times between the moment she conceived me in her stomach from like a place called, now it's swanky, it was um, on Pine Street and Pine and Baker. And then right around the corner, if you go around literally to Baker in California is where the Filipino American Community Hall is, where all of us had our baptisms. And, you know, so I yet have to take people on that excursion, but many of the buildings in that first I literally, literally would look at these negatives. I mean, I, didn't, I don't have any fancy equipment. And why my mother didn't get to it and throw it out, let's just thank God for that. He <laughs> that she did not get to it before it could get discarded. And before your father's death, did you get a chance to talk to him about that? So here's how it goes. Um, this basement is big. It's, you could fit three cars, and there was this enlarger. He had it tied on to one of the beams in the basement, and I'd walk by one of the cubby holes where the furnace was, and there was this painting of him, and that got lost because I was careless. I thought I'd get it reframed. I never retrieved it. Um, and I get to go with him during summers to pick up his paycheck, in his Chevy Bel Air. He always had a Chevy Bel Air. And he would tell me things like, well, one day, um, how about I build us a dark room and I'll teach you photography. But his thing when I was a kid was the two and a quarter camera. And then he was crazy about, um, do you remember the Super 8 little movie camera things? That. So my mom got him that in the 70s because she held every paycheck and that's how they were able to get the things and afford the things because he had that great job at the, the Army Hospital. But yeah, so he told me things such as that, but never ever did he stop to tell me, but he would say things like, I was the best damn photographer. That's when we was kind of drinking and we were out with these big what I, what I, World War II veteran late team landing parties. And yeah, th that's, that's the extent. I'm really curious about this. What drew him to to take the pictures, in particular, which is my background, um, of the farmland and the camps? Oh, and, thank and, you. And, those, uh, and what drew him there? He must have had a connection between the people in the camps. And oh, okay, so some of thank you. Yes. I, I saw the collection when you were in Sacramento at the library. Oh. Uh, yes. You were. Oh. Wait, wait, there were two shows at the Golden State Museum back in the early 2000s and the more recent one, which was... At the, uh, it was a uh, library. Mm, the small show? I'm not sure. Was it this last year or was it like... Well, it was fall. Okay, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's the smaller venue. Um, I'll answer that very quickly. 
up, but not so quickly. So his brother was, Uncle Cirillo, was out on every farm. And of course he would go see his brother on his day off. And then he got to know his cohorts. I even met the people that my uncle was the farm um, employee of, Tony Sakig. There's a building out there called Northside. I don't know if she died, Lily, Lily Sakig. She's still alive. Um, so yeah, so the, and, and some of the most beautiful photographs are the ones out there, out in the rural areas. Because I believe there was also a rodeo. He did some families in Hayward. And I think, you know, just knowing my father and his heart, you know, he loved the people he was, you know, in touch with and in community with. And that was his way of celebrating. Well, and I think the funny thing about it all, because I asked myself, I mean, I've looked at a lot of photography. I'm by no means like, you know, a classically trained uh, art photography curator, but you know, there's just something magical if you assemble these things and there's, and, and Stanford, I didn't have any, they picked all those out. But again, it's like, you just look at them over and over again and it's like, yeah, it doesn't look like these blank photographs. They're actually, I feel like they're looking back at us. I don't know, that's kind of the extent of, yeah, I thank you for asking that question. Um, it's because he, that was his only brother. And so that must have meant they really loved each other, even though Uncle Cirilla could be a handful, because he was always the one getting into something. <laughs> Uh, I mean, like, really devoting myself to it? Okay, I, I know all of you have, do you ever, you know, when you have this thing and you don't, I mean, I don't know, how can I describe this sensation about this whole thing? I was trying so hard to make myself fit in. I think some of you just go right through it, you know, you get married, you have a family, and something about this body of work right to really look at it it's not like you could just figure it out like I said I didn't have all the high-end equipment I couldn't have afford to scan the whole collection and certain things stood out in the negative form and you can't really see them until you and I had to really watch what I was really looking um, after I had this really bad car crash in I think I was about 30 and then like I said Peter just pushed me so that's several years into the whole episode you take yourself now and you go back in time. You take yourself to the 30 year old self. What would you tell yourself on how you would portray your dad's legacy? You know what? I. How would you do that? That's a tough question because, you know, that's like half the age back, going backwards. Um, like I said, I had many. I said epiphanies is the word I'll use, you know. At first I was excited and then I was sad. I was sad because who was going to believe any of this, right? And we, I'd get drunk with my high college friends and we'd be talking all kinds of nonsense like, girl, you know, and, and, and it happened. So what can I tell you that, I mean, it wasn't because I felt that it wasn't relevant. Some people have used the word um, valuable. It's priceless to me because it's my father. Right, but it's even more interesting that you know you all know because you saw just a handful of it. This stuff is really gorgeous. It is. So what can I say? It's like it. It, it wasn't. I mean, it was. I mean, the more I got to talk about it and tell on it and tell on myself and not be ashamed of like, why isn't it? And not hear other people say, well, you're going to need this person and you're going to, and like Dorothy said, just do it. <laughs> uh, first of all, I can't believe it's been, what, 30 years? Believe it. <laughs> no, it seems like 50. No, believe it. You haven't changed. Uh, yeah. 
But I haven't heard a cuss word from you yet. I know. No, I don't always cuss. By the way, I, you know, my partner, my partner used to. Well, you know, I think it's a proven fact that those that do are kind of like high up on the strata of like intelligence. So I'm not gonna. <laughs> I, I do have a question. Though. Uh, I know this was a, a traveling news service. Correct. And I couldn't thinking, I, I, I don't know what the scheduling was, but that meant you had to do a lot of traveling. I did. Yeah. Well. How was that? Can you tell me? I, I can't wait to tell you. Thank you. That could be charged. Um, you know what? That was the biggest blessing. I'll tell you about that, Peter. Thank you for that question. Um, I feel like this. I would have never seen the things I did get to see and it was a privilege to do that because I would get these calls from the hosting venues with the Smithsonian tour and they'd say, "Miss Alvarado, were you available to come and open your father's show? Because I guess this was, I, I know it's noted. Um, Franklin Odo at the time, uh, he just passed, also championed Janet. And the agreement was since they didn't have a curator for Filipino American history at the Smithsonian. He was the head guy for Asian Pacific American uh, Center. And we agreed that Franklin Odo would co-curate the show and then it would go on it. Cause then they wanted to tour it. And I was like, wow, you know, like Forrest Gump, like I said earlier, like what is going on? I felt like, oh my God, you know, I just walk into people and I'd be at a Fonz conference. Oh, that lady wants to talk to you about your dad. And, and that's again, quirky because they would call me and, oh my God, it went to get this. It went to places like Honolulu at the Lincoln Arts Center. Um, it went to the Empire State Building in New York, uh, the immigration Ellis Island, you know. I mean, it went to the UCLA Fowler Cultural Museum. I mean, it was just amazing. And that was a gift from my dad. Talking story? Get it, they'll edit it. Uh, I want to do two stories, uh, I guess. Oh, one more, one more. One more. No, that's it. Of course. First of all, thank you, Jared, for, um, I guess, um, inspiring not only Filipino Americans, but other Americans to look into their history. So that's an inspiration. And to, to see pictures and uh, but it also augments what we're doing here at the museum. It augments what Thomas is doing in general. Um, hopefully the schools will work with you to 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 get your exhibits there. Um, when I had the opportunity to be a panelist at the opening exhibit at the South King County Museum. We had a whole series of questions that uh, the uh, executive director, Philip Malo, asked each one of the panelists. And one of the questions was, what picture in this whole exhibit inspired you the most? And I thought about it and I said to myself, I said, every one of them did. But I had the opportunity to just coincidentally be in the exhibit when Robert was there, and Robert pointed at the picture and he said, his dad, and I said, wow, now we have a story. <laughs> because originally you just seen the picture of the musicians, and when Robert pointed to his dad, he said, bam, now we have a story. And just thinking back, each one of those pictures had a story. You know, it's like, what happened to all those kids that were in sitting around that the picture there of the kids that were sitting around at the party? How what are they doing now? You know, are they doctors, lawyers? Correct. Yes. Presidents, board members. What are they doing now? But the Robert story in particular that he, he had his dad's guitar. And uh, 
So he's, he's carrying some physical DNA, so to speak, of, of his family history. But it wasn't to a year exhibit, you know, uh, exposed that, created the opportunity to see that, and uh, just, just generically, I hope that the people who see our exhibits here and, and your traveling exhibit uh, be inspired. Because I can actually remember seeing pictures like that in our family uh, when we have family reunions. And we can go along and say, that person is doing this and go to every person in there and tell what their history was. So, very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to pick up on what Mel was talking about because uh, there's a story that occurred to me, but it wasn't anything about you so much. It was him. The picture that he showed uh, of the musicians. Uh, the story that I have is, I remember those folks used to practice at your dad's house pretty regularly. And um, I was a student at that time at San Jose State. And um, I, I used to go to your house because it was nearby, I remember. And um, I couldn't help but think how, how things really, um, I, it's, it's hard to describe, but Mel was talking about where, where are they now? What have they done? Well, one story is that I was there, and I'm here now. But the other story is that Max Lawler's brother was in that picture also. And, and uh, he happened to be the uh, father of my current Leona. So it's, it's a connection that we all had me thinking that um, there's a story there. And you know, thank you, Bob. Anybody else?
marks? Oh, I'm over here. <laughs> so, <laughs> they asked myself a question. Um, I do, I do. Well, anyway, so I, I know that a lot kind of got omitted or I mean, we were just, like Robert pointed out, a more of a casual um, afternoon together um, and listening to you all and, and feeling like I've just come here for another family picnic um, to celebrate a nice day together and looking at the artifacts in front of me, around me, sitting here at the sacred space, uh, at the museum. Um, and I think, like I kind of said in the middle of all this, thank you again, Robert, for your friendship, everybody, and our kinship. And we have younger generations here, like Nikki Dick Tanghill. I was running with her father back when Pistahan was a little grass, and we'd all go to her parents' bookstore. Uh, right there and it's still standing and so again I thank you sir for for you know I know you just met me but and I see your San Jose State cap and the time frame I probably was three and a half years old whatever you're referring to and and to see the relevance and not just my mouth kind of describing the love the deep respect and reverence I have for this legacy my legacy our legacy um, and we have one two or three younger people with us today. And we're still young, as far as I'm concerned. But here's the end note. And I think, Robert, again, I can't thank you enough for you, know, you and Albert in between my head talking about where it should go. Because again, we have a Yale scholar from Taiwan that had an Andy Warhol Foundation grant that decided to pluck a paragraph and like dedicate it to this particular image in the collection that gave it reverence in the world of art. I think that's the, you know, and I wasn't being disrespectful in referencing um, Larry at Leong or Carlos Bulusan. Of course, that's the dream from my father. He's an artist. Don't we need that? And I'm not turning the wheel. Everybody's been grinding these wheels with me. And I just feel like if there's one last locomotive thing I'm going to do, like a freight train, it's this. Um, and I don't have to do much. I do have to do some more work and feather my new, I'm calling it, and I'm sure other people like you, all leaders and servant leaders, like I have been for many, many years for this vision for my father, um, and you all carrying this vision out for our, your own parents and for the organization funds. I don't, I felt like a lone ranger, but to be able to, again, get these phone calls from major institutions and their historians and departments curious now about who we are in a different light, if you will. And I think I owe a debt of gratitude to both my parents because without them, I wouldn't have a Filipino-American life or an experience. And I want to say a bad word right now, but I'm going to, and it is a effing good, good life, all of it. Um, so end notes. See the show before it leaves Mickey Grove. It's the original show that was celebrated around with the Smithsonian. And these people have been here for part A and B. And I think part C is like you pointed out, Mel and Peter, that it's important that we, I mean, I'm running into high school kids and when I'm trying to talk with them about this at Stanford, I, they're interns that are running around there at summertime. I stop and I go, I was your age when I discovered this. And then I turn to the camera and they're just like, right? Because I'm not an old lady, but they realize I could be like their grandmother or mother to say, to hear that and have those young minds just, you could feel it that, because the one girl that I was attracted to by her response is from San Jose. She likes photography, she likes writing, and her parents are working class. And she's just, she, she understood. And, and I thought, well, who's your teacher? What's his name? Mr. Tippett, Piedmont and San Jose. And I'm going, okay, how do you think about an upward bound program? You can deal with just the part that deals with San Jose and we can discover, and then we do something like a contest or whatever. And I think those are the things that keep me going forward because I can't teach Fonz people what they already know. Um, part two is that we will be taking another entourage to the Philippines in 2024. I'm kind of prematurely announcing it. We did it for the 75th commemoration of the late deliberation and it was a phenomenal life changing experience to actually go to the battlefield sites of where they went and 
we were changed. And the beautiful, prolific thing about going to the Philippines as a visitor from the United States with the father that fought in that battalion, the 1st Regiment, was they said thank you to us, that we remembered. The American families here and our dads, they said thank you. And that, that was priceless. Um, and then the part about the parade, again, it's not like, I'm, oh, I'm so excited to like squeeze into a Filipiniana and try to look, you know, fantastic on the parade day. I feel proud to carry the San Francisco uh, thread of remembering my dad's residences all over the city. In fact, where they were as houseboys up in Knob Hill. So I feel really, really blessed to be out there on a sunshiny August day, invite everybody to come and, um, and be at the parade. And I don't know, somebody walked in, somebody special. Can we introduce him before I close up? It's, uh, Dr. Richard. Richard, we waited just for you. Another Richard. My dad's a Richard. That's his American name, Ricardo. Everybody called him Richard. <laughs> Hi, Richard. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. Have a seat. <laughs> All right, thanks for coming.